My name's Liliana. And my name's Monica. And, and we're, we're from Marty Stevens Learning Center. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm Monica Alec. This is Through the Darkness. I don't yell or scream for help. It's too far away for me anyone to hear. I raise my arms, readying myself to yell. I step both feet apart and say, help me, give me light, please. After a moment of silence, I gradually lowered my arms back to my sides again in solemn. With the middle of my shirt sticking in sweat to my upper back, I decide to trudge forward only to stumble and trip with every step I made. So I finally stopped and felt around for a minute until I found a wall I could use for leverage. As I guide my hand in feather-like strokes, yet sometimes gripping the wall unbearably tight to keep me from tumbling down. I stop in place, my feet uneven with each other. I balance myself with the wall before moving my hand completely. I raise my arms once more and place them outwards. I gather my thoughts as if rearranging them for a clearer insight of what must be done. I muster all of my energy and yell with great power. I demand light to seek in these caves, and with more force I bellowed out, I demand light to guide me safely. I closed my eyes tight as a pinch, and then felt it. I felt the energy traveling from my chest, swirling to my collar, tingling through my upper arms, right down to my forearms. All the heat, yet so cool at the same time. I could feel it muster inside my palms. All at once, I could feel the hot turn to cold, while the cold turned to hot, as the energy left my body, leaving me astonished that one of the few times I need help, it was actually given. All around me were various shades of oranges, yellows, and reds, hypnotizing me with every stroke of my eye. I didn't realize the different shades of magnificence weren't part of these great caves, but were in fact coming from inside of me. Every wave of each finger made a new splash of wonder that struck me in awe. But once my feet were in motion, my awe began to wore off me in waves, and I trudged back up the great caves I had fallen into, all to get back to the solemn world in which we live, and we live to be. My story begins with my job, which I no longer have. I moved to the city with hope of success, but that didn't happen. Instead, I got in return a crappy job in a crappy store in a crappy part of town. I was doing fine up until the point I got fired. Being fired was one of the most tragic things that could happen to me since I only had that job. In pursuit of another yet mediocre lifestyle, I searched for another. A few weeks passed and I caught a job at Walmart working night shifts. A month goes by and I, come, and I came to the realization that life is lonely. Even though we live in a world where you never are really alone. I decided to get a dog, but he ran away a short few weeks after. A sad life it was. So I got a cat. Typical, right? I raised her since she was a kitten. And her name was Athena. She was a year old when her life was ended. She was hit by a car. So at that point, I decided to stop getting pets. They were expensive anyway. Day after day goes by, day of 12 hour shifts at work. I started saving to get a better living space. A month later, I've finally done it. Now I own my own trailer and I moved in all on my own. The day goes by and I awake at 6.30 p.m. for my job at eight to seven the next morning. I shower and do all the stuff I needed to do before work and went. I missed my bus getting out of work and decided to walk. The roads were foggy as I walked home. I turned across the road and a car came and swiftly and took my life almost as fast. As I lied there in the road dying, my final thought thoughts to myself was this, the not so silent killer. Twas this my final breath? I wouldn't know until it was over. All life is, a, is an abyss once you are pushed off the edge, you are falling and you are forced to go along with it. Some people fall for an entire lifetime. Others, at times, stop falling when they are not supposed to, resulting in an unnatural death. The afterlife can be different for all. I couldn't feel a thing. 
I take one final breath as I close my eyes and fall into an eternal sleep. The end. Hi, my name is Maggie Harvey, and I'm going to be reading you a story that I wrote about this painting called Protesters for the Indian Statue. I walk into the parking lot of Cumberland Farms, practically tasting a cotton candy hyperfreeze. As I am just about to go in the store, I hear people shouting, Not your mascot! Not your mascot! I walk up to one of the protesters and say, What is this? The protest says, We are protesting the fact that Skowhegan's name is the Indians. I look the guy dead in the eye and say, you need to stop protesting now. As a fellow Indian pride girl, this is ridiculous. You need to stop now. As I walk away from the crowd, I hold my head up high, knowing I did Skowhegan proud. We stand here watching everything we know and love being destroyed. The world is spinning, memories of our childhood going through my head. And soon, we will have nothing left. My life is ruined. I had everything, a place to call home, people who loved me. But now, deaths have happened, our home is gone, and I have nowhere to run to but into his arms. The man stood before the landscape, a mountain range in the distance, with green trees covering the hills and valleys in front. Clouds drifted by on the light blue sky, and as he took it all in, he painted it on the canvas in front of him. Suddenly, his peace was interrupted by the brakes of the truck squealing to a stop, and and a man rolled down the window. As the painter turned around, he heard him start to mock his art, the assumed wife at the wheel laughing along. On the side of their rusty red truck, there was a sign that read, National Park, no. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Fernkiss from Cornville Regional Charter School, Skowhegan Campus. I would like to read to you a short story written by one of our learners that wishes to remain anonymous. I am blind. I used to be able to see all the colors of the world. Everything was fine when I was younger. Everything was better when I was younger. I used to paint all the time. I loved painting more than anything in this world. The best thing was once again all the color. Mixing them, smearing them, creating with them. Now once in a while, I'll take my old paintings and all I can do is feel them. I liked being able to see everything and the way everything moved and the ways everything went together. I liked it better when the world was beautiful. Now it's dark, it's dull, it's boring. I feel like a helpless child being brought into a room with a blindfold and there's millions of beautiful things around me, my favorite things, but all I can do is sit. Once in a while, I get up and feel around just to torture myself with the knowledge of not being able to actually enjoy what I'm experiencing. It's how I feel whenever I sit on my bed and hold these old paintings. I hate it when people complain about having to get out and do things. Why are they so stupid? Why can't they understand and enjoy the beautiful world they get to see? Why would you just sit and stare at a screen when there's so much you should be enjoying? I'm Lydia. I'm a student from the Cornville Regional Charter School, Skokie campus, and this is my story. I am so sad because I am the earth. You walk on me and live on me, but you do not care for me. You blow things up and, and release toxins into the air and waters. You live on me, but you pay no heed to what you do to me. But you live on me. I am the earth. Um, I'm Rachel from the Cornville Regional Charter School, Skokegan campus, and this is <laughs> my story. Um, my world revolves around me. I am my world, but do I really always want to be in my own world? It gets tiring, really, always having everything about yourself. I've lived so long in my own world, always having everything about myself, only caring about myself. But maybe that is my defense. If I try hard enough not to care, then maybe nothing bad will ever happen, for I will always be in charge of my own world. It will always be me making a decision. I will always have my feeling of control. But I've lived so long in my world, always there, always alone, that I'm scared to be a part of other people's worlds, to open up my world so it really doesn't belong to me anymore, to drown myself in, the, in other people's worlds, to be willing to be polluted or hurt. To allow people to cut out pieces of me as if cutting down a tree, a tree that will never grow back. 
So maybe I shall stay in my world a little longer, even though maybe it is I that is ruining my world. Hi, I'm a learner from Cornville Regional Charter School Skowhegan campus. It was a sunny, quiet, clear, light breeze day. The old man woke up with the sun shining through his window. He looked through the window and saw how lonely the day was. What a beautiful, what a colorful day. He said it with an excited, calm voice. He got out of bed and slipped on a pair of green jeans and a blue and a navy blue knitted sweater with some black socks. Then he heard Duck bark loudly. Mr. James, the old man, opened his bedroom door. Duck was right by the door, sitting down with his walking leash in his mouth, with it with dog slobber covered all over it like usual. Duck drops the leash and barks again. Mr. James picked up the leash, then walks to the kitchen and puts the leash back on the hook, where it was before Duck got it. Duck follows Mr. James to the door, thinking he's going to go for his normal morning walk. But instead, he just puts the leash back onto the hook and walks to the kitchen. You really want to go for a walk, don't you? Mr. James said to Duck, and then patted his head, continue walking. Mr. James makes a fresh cup of coffee and goes to the living room, sits down in his casual spot, and turns on the TV. Duck doesn't follow him towards the living room. He just lays by the door, wanting to go for his morning walks. Duck, oh duck, shouts Mr. James. Duck gets up and grabs the leash out of his mouth again with all of his slobber all over it. And then you hear duck, Duck's paws run into the living room with the leash in his mouth. Mr. James finishes his casual cup of coffee and then sits down to the table next to the chair. Then grabs the leash, clips it on around the Duke's, duck's collar, walks up to the front door, and steps out. A light comes through Mr. James, giving him a nice relaxation and chill feeling through his spine. Wow, it's a beautiful day. Ah, Mr. James says. And Mr. James and his dog walk down the road. Duck's hair is blowing back as he walks. Then they walk around town. They pass houses and other people giving them hellos and waves. And Mr. James responds with a simple hello and a nod back. I'm Molly from CRSES Sacohegan, and this is my story. Everything was black, the floors, the wall. You wouldn't be able to see your hand in front of your face. He pulled his knees close to his chest. The blue-green hospital clothes he was given were very thin and cold. A strong, musty fit smell filled his nostrils. The man could barely see the light at the end. He tried to climb to it, but he would not he would get scared and fall. He tried and tried until he was bruised and bloody, but he still couldn't climb up. So he decided to yell and wave his hands at the light, hoping someone would hear him or maybe just see him. After trying and trying, yelling and yelling, he gives up and lies down on the cold hard ground wishing he could get out, hoping someone would find him. A couple days before a John Doe had been admitted to the Royal Albany Hospital. The man was found on the side of the road, knocked out in a weird-looking pants suit. He still hasn't woken up. He has been out for at least three days. No one knows who he is, where he came from, or why he was in the ditch. The doctors think he might have been on some type of drug, but they still have to run the tests. After all the tests and pricks, they still can't find out the reason for his coma. The doctors are freaking out about this weird man. Reporters have come for miles to hear the story of the hospital's John Doe. It was a normal day. The nurse was doing her usual rounds and routine of checking on the patients. When she gets to the John Doe's bed, and to her surprise, it was empty. She runs to get the man's doctor to find out what happened, and of course, he doesn't know either. He opens his eyes. After looking around the room, he realizes where he is, jolts upright, takes out his IV, and stands up. He opens the hospital doors and starts running, running as fast as he can. He doesn't know what, who he is, why he's running, or where he's going. All of a sudden, he's falling to something dark, smelly, and scary. He's scared and confused. He woke up in the hospital knowing nothing. He wished he could just remember. Okay. My name is Aubrey, and I go to the Cornville Regional Charter School, so he can, and this is my story. Maggie walked along the rocks of the beach to get away from her foster parents and the annoying foster kids there. She was the kind of person that when she couldn't figure out her problems on her own, she relied on the ocean to take care of her, especially since her parents were gone. When she reached her usual spot, she was surprised to find someone else there. She watched him for a while before she cleared her throat. 
She turned around and almost dropped his fishing. He turned around and he almost dropped his fishing pole. He had short brown hair and was wearing a baseball cap. Hi, I'm Maggie, she said. Um, am I in your way? I can move if you want me to, he said uncertainly. Oh no, you're fine. I just come up here to get away sometimes. Same, my name's Jason, by the way. Nice to meet you, Maggie says as she sits down beside him. She takes off her backpack and takes out a small leather journal and a pen. When she opens the journal, she, she clearly flips to a blank page so Jason couldn't see her written words. Where do you live, Jason asked after a while. She finished up what she was writing and said, Bartlett Road, how about you? Same, I've never seen you there. What's your address? 328, the house with the big red barn on back. The orphanage, you mean, Maggie says rather than asks. Uh, yeah, he replied without emotion. I'm sorry, I know what it's like. I don't think you do, though. I'm a foster kid. Oh, what happened to your parents? Maggie didn't answer, and after a while, Jason whispered something to her. She took out her journal, writes something, and rips the page up. She skillfully folds it into a triangle and throws it at him. Oh, she, he said jokingly, as he puts down the fishing, fishing pole. Just read it, Maggie says impatiently. The note said, my mom left after my dad died. I was only five, so I don't remember them that well. I do miss them, though. He frowned and took the pen from her hand. He wrote something and handed the letter back. Really? Me too. Really? Maggie asked, interested. Yeah, I miss them a lot, especially since the people at the orphanage are so, well, you know how it is. Wait, what were your parents' names? She said, hiding her face. Don't cry, please. What were their names? She repeated. Grace and John Campbell. Mine too, she said, putting her hand to her head. No, 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 that can't be, he said. What's your birthday? Maggie asked, wiping the tears from her face. June 12th. Why? My birthday is June 12th, too, she said. She starts to cry again. We're twins, Jason said flatly. Maggie takes him into a tight hug and doesn't let go for several minutes. Everyone told Maggie that if she didn't make it at this home, she wouldn't have it anywhere else. But now it doesn't matter if she finally found her family. Well, they found each other, I suppose. My name is Kat, and I'm a student at Cornville Regional Charter School, Skowhegan Campus. And this is my story. Once, a, once long ago, titans roamed the earth. Ice, tornado, lava, and earth but they wanted to go into human form so they can roam like we do. But they did not like it down on Earth, so they roamed Earth as sad as can be. Then they heard someone talking about Mount Olympus. They said, if you have the true spirit, a true soul, you can, either you can enter the realm of gods, and if you betray them, you get punished by Zeus. They were happy. They got together to make a plan. The plan was become the rulers of Earth. They had no idea Zeus was the god of all gods and the world. They went to the top of, a, of the Olympus mountain. As they prayed, they heard a big voice telling them to turn into their true form. The voice kept saying the same thing over and over again. So they turned into their true form and waited. They heard the voice again, is your soul true? And they all said yes. There was a big flash of thunder, and there, and then there was a gate. They entered. They entered, and that same voice spoke. If you betray me and your kind, you will get punished, and no com communication with the underworld either. the The titans nodded their heads as they walked in. There were a lot of gods. There was the god of the sun, Hermes. There was also the god of sea, Poseidon. They were scared, but then Zeus walked in. He welcomed the new guest. That night, they sat down and had a feast. Then the Titans asked, what is the underworld? All the gods, even Zeus, froze and stared. Zeus stood up and said, nothing you need to worry about, son. Then he left the room. They all left to go into the rooms and their thrones. The Titans stayed out late trying to think of what they did wrong. Then they heard another voice. It was not deep like Zeus, but kind of sweet and soft. We could not see the person or the shadow in the, in the light of the stars. It was just a voice in the middle of nowhere. It was saying, come down to the underworld. It is so cool down there. They looked at each other and said, no, Zeus said we can't, we can't or we get punished and we don't want that. The voice came again, oh, come on, do you believe him? He won't do that. Come on, it's fun down there. They looked at each other 
one more time. Fine. It it will should be fine. They all agreed, and they st started to go down the mountain. When they got down, they saw a big castle. They went to the castle and saw him, Hades, the god of the underworld. Um, we need to go. S sorry, maybe we can visit later. They started to run, and they got to the mountain. They climbed as fast as they could because it was almost day. They got to the top, and Zeus was there. I thought I told you guys to stay away from that place. I'm sorry, we all are. Then Zeus looked sad. You guys have disobeyed me. You have to be punished. There was a big flash, then they were in a hole. At the top was Zeus. I'm sorry. Then he turned away. They turned into their human form, and Earth said, the Earth Titan said, I'm sorry, as a, t as a tear fell down his cheek, he looked up at the last moment to see the sea collapse on them.